So there's a story that has been told about a woman who went to the gates of heaven. And I want to uh, uh, emphasize that this isn't really how getting into heaven works. It's just a story. Uh, but she comes to the gates of heaven, and there she's met by St. Peter. And she looks through the gates, and heaven looks beautiful. And she says to St. Peter, this place looks awesome. How do I get inside? And St. Peter says, well, you have to spell a word. And the woman says, well, what is the word? And St. Peter says, love. So she spells love, and St. Peter opens the gates and lets her, lets her in. Now, a few months later, St. Peter had some important business elsewhere in heaven that he had to do. And so he asked this woman if she could stand at the gate for him. So she agrees to do that. And while she's standing there, her husband comes to the gate. And she says to him, oh, hello, George. How are things going with you? He goes, well, let me tell you, after your long illness of, and then you died, of course I grieved with you, or grieved for you. Uh, but then I married that cute young nurse that was looking after you, and uh, I won the lottery. So we sold that little house that you and I used to live in, and we bought this huge mansion. And ever since, she and I have been traveling all over the world on vacation. In fact, I was on holiday, and I was, on wa I was water skiing when I wiped out, and my ski came up and hit me in the head, and that's why I'm here. <laughs> By the way, this place looks great. How do I get in? And the woman says, well, you have to spell a word. And her former husband says, oh, what's the word? She says, Czechoslovakia. <laughs> There's something about human beings or something in us that tends to sometimes make us jealous of other people's success, especially if it looks like they've maybe jumped the queue and they've They've gotten an unfair advantage and they've moved ahead of us. Like when somebody who was working at the same company as we do and they got hired after us and they get promoted to being our boss. Or maybe it's something as simple as being in a lineup for coffee at the coffee shop, line up to place your order and somebody jumps in the line ahead of you. And there's even a religious version of this and the way that looks is if uh, someone who maybe hasn't had as much time in the faith or perseverance in the faith, faith, somehow it looks like they've gone ahead of you in faith and maturity and God is blessing them more than he's blessing you. And so what do we do about this jealousy that tends to rise up in our hearts? And as we think about that question, we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 4 verses 14 to 30. So if you have a Bible or a Bible app, I invite you to turn there now. And as uh, we turn to our passage, uh, what we find is we've shifted. We were in the Gospel of Mark as we were uh, going through various passages in our Bible reading plan. And now we've shifted into the, into the Gospel of Luke. And the events described in this passage happen early in Jesus' ministry. It's, it's shortly after... Uh, the time when he was baptized at, a, at the Jordan River by John the Baptist. And then after that, he went into the desert and he fasted for 40 days. And during that time, he was tempted uh, by the devil, but he successfully resisted those temptations. And now what happens is Jesus comes into his home region, uh, the region around the Sea of Galilee. And Luke tells us, and Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and a report about him went out through all the surrounding country, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. And so Jesus is famous in the region. And then he comes to his hometown. And uh, people have obviously heard uh, about Jesus and what's happening with him, and, and they're kind of proud of him. It's kind of like when someone from your hometown makes it to the NHL. Like you're proud of your community and, and what 
part they may have had to play in the son or daughter of the community's success. And maybe as he comes back, people are also thinking, well, maybe he will do some of the miracles in our town that he did in some of those other towns. Like that passage where Jesus says, uh, physician, heal yourself. Uh, Another way of interpreting it is, physician, heal your own people. In other words, Jesus, when he said those words, was implying that maybe the people are thinking, well, he'll come back here and heal us, just like he healed all the other people in the other town. And so Jesus, as was his custom, he goes into the synagogue for worship, and uh, just like uh, we do at Walnut Grove Lutheran Church, people would take turns reading the scriptures, and so he stands up to read the scriptures, and the scroll of Isaiah is brought to him. And he opens it up to a very particular place, and he reads these words from Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then what he did was he sat down because uh, in uh, synagogue worship back then and even today, what happens is the teacher, the rabbi, sits down to do his teaching, whereas we tend to stand up. And what he says as he sits down is, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now, up until this point, all of the people are amazed at his teaching and they're thinking well of him and like, wow, this guy can really uh, teach. And they're thinking, isn't this Joseph's boy? Like, I didn't know he had that in him. And so uh, he still got the favor of the people, but all of that is about to change in just a moment. Because what happens is Jesus blows apart the framework that his listeners had for who God was and how God works. Now, the Jews always have been and always were God's people. But if they were to hear this uh, passage from Luke 61 and ask themselves the questions, well, who, is, who are the poor? Who are the ones in blindness? Who are the people for whom the Messiah is coming? They would say, for us. And that's true. The Messiah was sent by God for his chosen people. But all throughout salvation history, God was giving hints that he had a broader plan in mind. So, for example, in Genesis 12, when God is blessing Abram and telling him uh, that Uh, he was going to do something special through his family line. He also says this, in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And then the prophet Isaiah records these words as God speaking to his servant. He says, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations. So the nations is all the people, including all of the non-Jewish people. That my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. And so the salvation that God had in mind to bring to the world through the Messiah was going to be universal. It was going to be for all people. Now, it is one thing to say that God's Uh, plan of salvation for the world is going to be expanded. But it is quite another thing to point out times in salvation history when God actually favored Gentile people over Jewish people. And Jesus goes there. He tells his listeners, reminds them, because they would have known about this, about the time uh, during uh, the prophet Uh, Elijah, when he was prophesying and teaching, 
and there were many, many widows in dire need in the land of Israel. But Elijah didn't go to them. He went to a widow in the land of Sidon, a Gentile region to the north, present-day Lebanon, and he helped her. And then in the time of the prophet Elisha, there were many, many lepers in the land of Israel, and yet Elisha doesn't help them. Instead, he helps the general of a foreign army, Naaman of Syria, and he was cleansed of leprosy, and all the rest in the land of Israel were not. And the people that were present in the synagogue that day, when they heard these words from Jesus, they were so angry that they tried to get a hold of him and throw him off the edge of a cliff. They were so upset at God showing favoritism to Gentiles that they were going to kill, they wanted to kill the Jewish Messiah. But Jesus walked through their midst and disappeared. So what are we to uh, make of all of this? Well, the first thing that we need to understand is what jealousy really is. And jealousy is a fear of losing something or someone you value. And maybe Jesus' listeners that day were fearing that if God was favoring the Gentiles, then they would lose their special place in God's kingdom, that they would lose their special relationship with God. But here's the thing. You cannot lose with Jesus. You cannot lose with Jesus. First of all, God is for you. And we know that because of Jesus Christ. And it may not feel like God is for you, especially if you're new to the faith or maybe you're new to coming to church and maybe you look around and you see all these other people that have been around here for so much longer and you think, how could I ever um, have what they have? They must be way further down the road in their relationship with God. But I want to tell you, God doesn't look at whether or not we're members of a church or how long we may have been members of a church or how much time we spend in Bible study or prayer. He looks at the heart. And what he's looking for is hearts that realize that they are broken and they are in bondage and they need to be set free. And through his suffering and death on the cross, Jesus has set you free. Through his resurrection from the dead, he has opened the door for you to enter into eternal life with him. And that eternal life begins the moment that you believe. And you have been given his place in God's family. Jesus has made you an heir to all of the riches of heaven. You have forgiveness for all your sins and life and eternal life and salvation. You have freedom from condemnation and sin and death. And not, none of those things can ever, ever be taken away from you. And on top of that, what God does because he loves us, is he gives us tangible reminders of his love in our everyday lives through the many, many blessings he showers down upon us in this life. So do you have people around you that love you? That's a blessing from God. Do you have a dry roof over your heads and a warm bed in which to sleep? That's a blessing from God. And so often we take these things for granted. But they're actually little reminders. They're like fragments that remind us of the incredible blessings that we have in Jesus Christ. 
and of God's great and wonderful love for us. And so the thing is, the solution to our jealousy is to see what we already have in Jesus Christ. When Jesus spoke those words from Isaiah, he talked about uh, giving sight to the blind and setting captives free. And then he also said that uh, he was sent to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And uh, that's a reference to the year of Jubilee. Every 50 years, uh, what was supposed to happen was all Jewish slaves would be set free, all debts would be canceled, and uh, all family land would be returned back to their original family. And that's a picture of what uh, Jesus Christ has done for us. He has given us uh, a new life. He has set us free from all of our uh, debts. It's so easy for us to get in bondage to the things of the world, uh, whether it's uh, likes on social media or um, some kind of a substance or some kind of a habit. But Jesus came to give you a life of freedom in him, a life where you're free to live in his love. And so this is why Jesus' mission, and that's what he was describing for us in Luke chapter 4, that's why his mission is what matters most. It's because his mission is what tells people about the freedom that he has for them and for the whole world. And not only does Jesus uh, fulfill his mission through his death and resurrection, but he also invites us to be part of his mission. And through faith in Jesus Christ, even the ordinary, everyday moments of our lives can take on eternal significance because each moment with Jesus has the potential to make an eternal difference in the life of someone else. So there is a legend about a man named Ali Hafed. And he was a very wealthy Persian, ma Persian man living in India. And he was very content. He had a large farm. He had orchards. He had gardens. Um, but one day, someone came and talked to him about diamonds and told him how wealthy he would be if he could have a diamond mine. And so Ali sold his farm and then went searching all around the world for a diamond mine. But he never, ever, ever found one. And later in his uh, life, he was broken and discouraged, and he ended up committing suicide. Now, the man who bought his farm, one day he was watering his camel in the stream, and he looked down and he noticed a flash of light in the water. And so he dug in the sand, and he pulled out a rock that reflected all the various colors of the rainbow. And that turned out to be the Golconda Diamond Mine, which is one of the largest diamond mines in the world. And if Ali would have simply stayed home and tended his garden, he would have found that he would have had acres and acres of diamonds. And it's the same thing with you and I. If we simply just stay home in Jesus Christ, and let him tend the relationship that we have with each other. We will find that we are rich beyond our wildest dreams. And so the challenge that I want to leave with you today is this. To remember who you are, the possessions you have, and the purpose you have been given in Jesus. Because none of those things can ever be taken away from you. And if somebody else is blessed, you are in no way diminished by their blessing. Because you see, God does not work on a zero-sum game. When someone else is blessed, he works on... Uh, the, one of the two of the great values of uh, the kingdom are generosity and blessing. And so when other people are blessed, what happens is 
the amount of uh, a blessing in the kingdom of God just multiplies. God's math is different from ours. And so that's why it's such a blessing for us to give. Because in giving, we don't lose. In giving, we bless the other person, but we're also blessed by God in the process. As Pastor Carl would often say, you cannot outgive God. And so when we see someone else who has success, we can be happy for them, knowing that the great and wonderful God who is generously blessing them is the same great and wonderful God who has generally, generously blessed us. Amen. Dear Jesus, we thank you for the many, many blessings uh, you shower down upon us. And we pray, Lord, that you would uh, not take those bless. You would help us to not take those blessings for granted, uh, but you would help us to live with thankful hearts and to reflect your love and your generosity and your blessing uh, into the world around us. Uh, we ask this in your holy and precious name, and all God's people said, Amen.